This is a brunch pre-Oscars mini podcast that contains spoilers, but can't imagine you care. If you haven't seen the movie and you're afraid of spoilers, there's no way you'd logically seek out a podcast about the movie. Let us begin. American fiction. Written and directed by former Gawker editor Cord Jefferson in his feature directorial debut tells a story of a frustrated writer whose satire of modern black books gets taken seriously by liberal white people. It has a 94 on Rotten Tomatoes with an audience score of 96 and runs one hour and 57 minutes. American fiction sits eighth in betting odds among Best Picture nominees at plus 8,000. It is nominated for five Academy Awards, Best Picture, Best Actor, Jeffrey Wright, Best Supporting Actor, Sterling K. Brown, Best Adapted Screenplay, Cord Jefferson, best original score laura karpman i haven't as of this recording fleshed out how i would rank the best picture nominees this year because i still don't even know if i'm putting like poor things ahead of oppenheimer but this for sure i promise when i bang out my rankings will be top four i loved american fiction interesting i definitely wouldn't put it uh that high it's in my bottom half of um of best picture noms but i did very much enjoy my time with this movie this has like a this is the how did that movie get nominated of like this is the disruptor i would say of the best picture noms uh, either that or barbie because barbie uh disrupts the list by not being as good as the other movies but like this movie is ballsy takes chances doesn't fucking adhere to whatever structure it should have it takes the piss a lot. It makes fun of its demographic. It makes fun of its viewer. I think it's it. It comes from if you were to tell me, uh, like, here are ten movies. One of them is made by an extremely online person. I would guess that this would be the one. And I say that in a flattering way of uh, of Cord Jefferson. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. Uh, it would be like this in Barbie, but like in the uh, online derogatory for <laughs> yeah, Barbie. Barbie and online endearing for American fiction. Uh, this is up there with the uh, funniest movies of the year for sure. Uh, I thought this movie was tremendous in in its humor and and like especially the strengths of this movie for me. Like number one by far, the family interactions and like the dialogue and the uh like the person to person interactions the story i thought was like a bit w weaker um like or i guess maybe weaker it, it felt abandoned at times honestly like they spend a lot of the time away from the central storyline of the movie which it, it, which to me or i guess like my interpreted central storyline which was the, him as a writer it's more about him as a person and him and his like relationship to his family and relationship to himself. Yeah, that that's a very good point. The only times where I was like, get back to the other stuff is where they were focusing on the protagonist's actual life. I, Cause I thought that this like, what interested me is the idea of somebody very talented and very smarter, or very, uh, very smarter, and, uh, <laughs> nice. and smarter than what he feels is being accepted as good, having to navigate the idea of being successful mm -hmm. when he wasn't even trying to be successful. He's trying to mock what people are saying is good, and he's trying to exploit how shallow uh, some devices can be. And like yeah. I would have taken more scenes with him and Issa Rae's character because she like holds up a pretty valid mirror to him at points more so than I would take scenes with him and his love interest. And maybe that's mean to say like, don't fucking care about the character. I just like I feel like you're pulling at a very interesting societal thread right now, and I would rather take that than what some dude hanging around Quincy is how he's spending his days. Like if if I wanted that, we well, like we're, we're from here, we have our lives, you know? I, I get that, but I also think there was the biggest strength of the movie. Like, I, th I think they did so well with those scenes and with those characters. Um, and, and maybe if they had fleshed out the other stuff more, it, it, I would have been more inclined to be like, give me more of that stuff. But in terms of what we're presented with, that was the strongest point of the movie. I, you know, it doesn't surprise me the more that I think about it th that you liked this movie a lot more than I did. Because I, I think that, like, this is something that you think about a lot in terms of, like, 
you love Father John Misty. This guy is Father John Misty, <laughs> basically, is. in that he he realizes how stupid everybody else is. And the things that are popular are being like gar gargled up in a trough. And it's not necessarily like fine dining. But those restaurants are are more successful than some of the, the finer establishments that aren't as accessible. Yeah. Oh, definitely. The like he, he he's not he's he's trying to cater to people with refined palates, but it's more rare to find a refined palate than somebody who will just eat up whatever they get at a airport bookshop. Exactly. And the thing I mean, that even goes down to that's like a Father John Misty thing it, itself. Like the uh, the thing that's interesting to me about this character is he kind of ends up getting faced with, well, how could he sleep at night if he keeps going through with this initial joke that's now being taken seriously when i don't think he's really considering he couldn't sleep at night before so it's like should he just take this windfall and know he's sold out or remain a tortured artist who at least in the current climate is borderline guaranteed to not have success i right it, it's a it's a debate of like you know is it better to be have sleepless nights uh like knowing you stayed true to yourself and like had your integrity or whatever, or is it better to be sleepless at night knowing that at least you can take care of your family and, and live a little bit comfortably and, and, and weighing that. Um, yeah. I, I, I think like some of the stuff that they did for like the humor in that was obviously very heavy handed, probably by design. Um, but like the, the Adam Brody <laughs> scenes for the director were just like fucking ridiculous. But maybe, I don't know, like maybe there are some industry people who watch that and say, that's a lot closer to real life than you think. These days, who the fuck knows? Um, I would like to talk about the rest of the cast. Uh, Jeffrey Wright is uh, nominated for Best Actor. He is a uh, very long shot, tied with Coleman Domingo for uh, the longest odds at Best Actor at plus 8,000. Sterling K. Brown has the longest odds at Best Supporting Actor at plus 4,000. And we said in the Barbie conversation, I think we said that we're not going to throw a fit over the fact that America Ferrara is being nominated because this is such a, a, a landslide win for Devai Joy Randolph anyway. So I'm not going to be too upset that America Ferrara got nominated probably over more deserving people. After seeing American Fiction, I was like, I really would have liked for Tracy Ellis Ross to be nominated for Best Supporting Actress. She's not in it a lot, but mm -hmm. boy, we've seen recent years the supporting character, uh, the supporting categories for sure can take someone who has like sub 10 minutes of screen time. And Tracy Ellis Ross, despite not being in a lot of this, was very, very important to this movie and knocked it out of the park. Yeah, a couple notes on uh, on supporting. Uh, Tracy Ellis Ross was great in this movie. Uh like you said, not in it a lot was pretty jarring when uh, she made her exit and Same. and uh, not in a bad way. Uh, I saw some people complaining about it that uh, happened too early. Um, I guess it's different in the book uh, as to how it's uh, presented in the movie. So that that was a bit jarring, but I think in an effective way and in, in a way that kind of illustrates the point that maybe they were trying to make with uh, with that. And we're gonna as, again off the top we're getting into spoilers here she dies pretty early yeah. in the movie and uh her death note after after she dies she has a death note for the family to read at her funeral the best death note i've ever heard <laughs> yeah in incredible i think you find out more about her as a character from reading the death note than you do from her actually like being in scenes which i thought was very cool and it made me be like damn I really wish that we could have had more of her, which I'm sure is exactly what her family is thinking in that moment, which I why, is why I, I found it palatable that she made that exit. Um, and it kind of speaks to like the fragility of life. And on the other hand, Sterling K. Brown was awesome in this movie. He was so really, nice. really great. And uh, uh, you said he has long odds for best supporting actor. He's obviously not going to win. I'm very glad that he earned a nomination because he deserves it. Yeah, I mean, not what you're typically getting out of Sterling K. Brown. Just like an absolute mess of a person who looks nothing like it. You know, like yeah. who in a pinch can 
get ready in three minutes and look like the best person at the dinner party when in real life he's just fucking doing coke and having sex every second of the day a hilarious uh a hilarious like dichotomy between his character and jeffrey wright's character where jeffrey wright is like there must be order there mu- we need <laughs> yeah. we need to figure out how to live this life the right way and serve our fellow man as best as possible and sterling k brown's character is like but what if I see a hot person? Yeah, he's like, <laughs> I spend too much time doing that. It's life is short, brother. Uh, if I see somebody hot, I'm gonna fuck them. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely <laughs> loved that. And uh, uh, that that uh, Sterling K. Brown also a tremendous actor who has a ton of range, and I think you see a lot of it in one particular scene. Is the uh, the scene where they walk into the house on the wedding day? And he's there with uh, the two two gentlemen that yep. uh, he was involved in curriculars with. Uh, that that whole scene from beginning to end was incredible. Uh, it starts off very funny, then like ends in a very emotional place. And Sterling Bra- Sterling K. Brown crushes it the entire way through. Yeah, I mean, I I loved this movie. As I said, it takes more chances. I I hear what you're saying about like the bones of the story uh, aren't too mind-blowing but they really stretch out that dough man they take it in some extreme directions and i like that especially like where the main character takes his story where he takes the film adaptation certainly i i've been interested in asking people's thoughts of the ending if they feel that it was like too cheap or too overtly mocking uh the whole process it borderline does the it was all a dream thing. Mm-hmm. It doesn't do that, but it's like having it end the way it ends. The the movie adaptation in it, I mean, is like yeah. similarly trite to saying, oh, okay, well, it was all a dream. But I love that. And I thought that Damn. that that stuck to what this guy was doing. He was like, I'm trying to think of something that can make you, the viewer, or the white person buying it, to say, this is too much. But no matter what I do, you clap and call me brave. Like, I am trying to fucking make a mockery of this thing. Right. Yeah, so that's why I, that's why I liked it a lot, is it kind of, like, it it turns, like, the camera around on you, for lack of a better term, and it's like, you are the fool. You are the <laughs> fool that we have been explaining for the last hour and a half. And I liked that a lot. Yeah, uh, positives, it, uh, extremely well acted. Uh I thought it looked very good. Like, I, I was not guessing that this movie would be... I think it's all shot in situate. Oh, really? Okay. Right? I mean, I, it's... It, I, I thought that, like, it was, like... I was shocked that it was in Boston. Yeah. It's a it's an extremely only in Boston movie. But it's mm-hmm. not, like, back bay. It's, and like... It's, and, and it's not making it its entire personality. Right. Like, they only uh, call each other uh, the R word, like, twice. He does say in, uh, yeah, towards the beginning of the movie, he's like, "I've already had a guy in a Bruins jersey ask if I if I thought that he was if I thought I was better than him." Oh, I I almost took on my phone to write down like this movie seems to understand Boston, except for that. That yeah. is not what would happen. No, people don't talk to each other in Boston. No, they don't. So especially uh, people in Bruins jerseys, they'll just yeah. look at you and like furrow their brow. Yeah, the, the people in Boston do not talk to each other and uh this movie like didn't do a ton with uh boston's racism or its segregation but i would say that that little detail i was like ah fuck they say they came so close to nailing it but that's the only wrong thing but then like 30 seconds later there was a joke about dorchester being black and the guy was like Actually, Dorchester is pretty white now. And I thought that was funny. (laughs) (laughs) That was funny. Which is extremely true. Right. Uh, Yeah. Only in Boston. Okay. Uh, I gave this a uh, four and a half out of uh, five on Letterboxd, which might be on the high side. I Mm -hmm. think that maybe I'd be like a four and a half. It's rounded. It's like a 4.4 that's rounded up to 4.5. But uh, where would you give it? Um, I haven't officially logged it yet. I'm thinking for maybe three and a half. Whoa. Um, 
I again like I I enjoyed my time with it, but I do think it's like a it's a a, a weak best picture nomination and I would have liked to see the actual like story fleshed out a bit more. To me, this felt more like a strong family movie than it was a strong movie about like fleshing out the the main subject of it. Yeah, I just I, I thought its social commentary was uh, was wicked. So I quite appreciated this uh, film. That is American fiction.